holds a special place in my heart. My loving wife spent a lot of years in her family worshiping with Skyview. I was uh, speaking to Andy in the foyer before, and I said, you know, we are connected through the blood of Christ, and that makes you my beloved. Mm -hmm. You love God. I love you. This is exactly how the gospel is meant to be. This is exactly how the family of God is meant to be. Amen. Amen. Right below that surface, I will tell you, we are connected through the blood of Christ. And I said to Andy, the next closest connection we have is Candy Higginbottom. <laughs> <laughs> Candy is known throughout. You've loved her. A lot of us, the last time we got to see each other was at Candy's 60th birthday party. What a time that was. What interests you in this passage? Is it the fact that Annie fathered Methuselah? That he had other sons and daughters? That we believe that Enoch was translated out of this life in a different way. Now that's pretty interesting. But I think the fact that Enoch walked with God. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me that Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. Do you dads feel like that? <laughs> you think you know anything at all until you've raised a teenager? <laughs> and it's after that you realize, oh, I need to be walking with God. <laughs> I don't want to do this on my own. <laughs> Enoch walked with God and was not for God to be. Well, <laughs> got it on. There it is. There we go. When I think about walking, there's a lot of different ways to walk. <laughs> and it's unusual to me that as I was contemplating this, that the animal kingdom came into my mind as to how they walk, how we tend to walk through life. Every one of these represents to me one of my grandsons. <laughs> I've got four grandsons. The youngest one, he's about to turn three years old. And boy, he makes me laugh like a penguin makes me laugh. He goes through the house, and if he hasn't hit the corner of a table with his head, I'm just so happy. <laughs> but he really does make me laugh the way he walks. Yesterday, I saw uh, a first t-ball game for another grandson of mine. And he hit that ball, and his little legs were going up and down so fast trying to get to first base. Kind of like that lizard walking on the water. <laughs> I got a grandson named Novak. He comes through life with strength. He rumbles at five years old like that elephant. Graceful, but with strength. My oldest grandson reminds me of this line. He's a rule follower. He's proud. And he's got a little bit of majesty. But these are the ways we walk through life. We're just going to battle with this for a while. Go ahead and give me the next one. Thank you. Okay. I'll just say, give me the next one. <laughs> All right. You know, Trundy and I love to walk. We spend a great deal of time in our marriage going through different aspects. I retired from the sheriff's office after 25 years at a pretty early age, and that gave us the opportunity to do a little traveling 
And I will tell you, if you ask, what's your favorite place? It is almost always somewhere beautiful that God created and that we're able to walk to. Right. Mm -hmm. Boy, that pulls the three of us in together. It's me, my wife, and God's creation. These are just a couple of shots from our most recent. That ain't a bear. That's my dog on that trail. <laughs> I didn't want you to be worried about my physical safety. <laughs> Rainbow Falls. Beautiful, beautiful place. These are up in the Smoky Mountains. We've been blessed that we have family that have a cabin up there, just like the Murrays have a cabin up there. You know, there's over 800 miles to hike through those parks up there. We haven't covered all of those yet. But we're working on it. Give me the next one. You know, when the pathway isn't too steep and it's not so rugged and I can keep my breath, this is my favorite way to walk. This is what my kids call the old man walk. <laughs> this is the saunter. Your hands have to be behind your back if you're saunter. I can do some pretty good contemplating. When I saunter, I don't have to saunter to contemplate, but I can't help but contemplate when I saunter. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Give me the next one. We were lucky to go out to California, and we were lucky enough to be able to hike Yosemite. We were able to go with my mom and Mr. Fred. And if you don't agree with the politics of California, that's okay. But what you can't disagree is that it is beautiful. Yeah. If you get the chance, please walk amongst the redwoods and the sequoias. Make your way to Yosemite. See if you don't find some awe-inspiring moments looking at God's creation. This fellow is John Muir, as you see. He was born in the first half of the 19th century. And he played a great deal in helping organize the national parks. John Muir didn't like the word hike. Give me the next one. John Muir, whoop, back up one. John Muir liked to saunter. This is a little story about an incident between this fella Albert Palmer as he met John Muir one day. He was resting in the shade and Mr. Muir overtook me on the trail. And he began to chat in that friendly way in which he delights to talk with everyone he meets. I said to him, Mr. Muir, someone told me you did not approve of the word hike. Is that so? His blue eyes flashed and with his Scotch accent he replied, I don't like either the word or the thing. <laughs> People ought to saunter in the mountains, not hike. Do you know the origin of that word, saunter? It's a beautiful word. Way back in the Middle Ages, people used to go on pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And when people in the villages through which they passed asked, where they were going, they would reply, A la Saint Thierre, to the Holy Land. And so they became known as Saint Thierres, or Saunterers. Now these mountains are our Holy Land, and we ought to saunter through them reverently, not hike through them. I don't discount the upsurge in New Ageism that wants to worship the creation. That's not for us to do. Right. Our holy land is anywhere that we are with God. Amen. Just Amen. like here today. But I will tell you, I believe our Heavenly Father prefers to saunter with us. 
Mm -hmm. Genesis 3. Think about that moment. Genesis 3 didn't turn out real good for us. But the beginning started out very nice. In the cool of the day, God came to the garden to walk with Adam and Eve. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. Abraham was directed to walk before his God. You know, these fellas had busy lives. Enoch had a lot of kids. Noah had a boat to build. Abraham had a lot of servants. Mm -hmm. They had to slow down. They had to back out if they were going to walk with their God. Walking implies a relationship, doesn't it? Yeah. Give me the next one. Do you think this is just code for obedience? No, there's a phrase for that. In fact, reference the kings of the Old Testament. If they did what was right in the sight of God, that was law keeping. This is walking. So what did that walk look like for them? For Adam and Eve, it was a wonderful time. For Enoch, he got to experience God. Well, how about you and I? How about you and I? Give me the next one. Uh, in John chapter 14, Philip asks Jesus, show us the Father. What does Jesus say? Have you seen me? Mm -hmm. Then you've seen the Father. Have you experienced relationship with me? Then you have done so with the Father. Sure. Well, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 24. And this is where we're going to spend our morning. It's in Luke chapter 24. And I want us to saunter to Emmaus with our Lord. Luke 24. And we're going to begin in verse 13. That very day. Two of them were going to the village named Emmaus. Tell me something about that day. Tell me something about that very day. Do you recall what day it was? It was the first day of the week. You recall what happened that morning? <laughs> Jesus rose from the grave. That very day was the most glorious day in all of humankind's history. That's right. Amen. Amen. That very day, the Son of God had gone down into Hades, had filled that up, and was not able to be kept there by the devil. He exited that and he came forth out of the earth that very day. And where do we find him? Well, we got two disciples and they're walking about three hours, about seven miles. They've left Jerusalem and they were walking and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? 
on that very day. They couldn't recognize him. Was that miraculous? Maybe so. They definitely didn't expect him. You know, there's probably a good reason Jesus may have kept himself in an unrecognizable state. I had stated earlier that I worked as a deputy sheriff. You ever go to a get-together and somebody introduces you as, this is my friend Chuck. He's a deputy sheriff. Uh -oh. It immediately <laughs> changes the conversation. <laughs> Maybe not amongst y'all. <laughs> you may be able to just talk about what we need to talk about, but a lot of other folks immediately curb their conversation. It hasn't gotten any better for me. Now, the other day we were at breakfast with a couple of friends, and the waitress comes up and the fellow says, this is Chuck, he preaches for us at church. Well, boy, <laughs> that changes conversation, doesn't it, Charles? You know good and well people don't talk the same way they do. You. Jesus wanted to know what was in their hearts. Might have been a good idea to keep his identity from them. They're going to speak the truth that way. Give me the next one. And Jesus says to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? that stopped them in their tracks. <clears throat> They're a little gobsmacked that anybody doesn't know what's happened. They stopped, stood still, and looking sad. Their countenance was falling. A couple of the versions actually have that in Jesus' question. I think the American Standard Version says, Jesus asks them, what are you all talking about as you walk looking so sad? Mm -hmm. They're looking down. Their shoulders are hunched. They're pretty well devastated. One of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? You don't know? Give me the next one. Jim, go ahead and give me the next one. You see, they knew about the crucifixion. They knew that his life had ended. What they didn't know, or what they didn't believe, was the resurrection. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Had they been told about it? Yeah. Did they believe it? Next one. Jesus says, what things? They said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet. In Matthew 16, Jesus says to his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? Some say you're a prophet. This doesn't sound like Peter's confession here, does it? That's right. You know, I want to I want to mention one thing here, an aside. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth. They had to identify us. But the way that would have been said is, reference Joshua or Yahshua of Nazareth. Yeah. 
I have a good friend worshiped with for years at Citrus Park. A fellow by the name of Keith Craig. And he used to say to me, you know, we are much more comfortable with the divinity of Christ than with the humanity of Christ. Boy, that's true. David, excellent job on the table this morning. Mm -hmm. Talked about Jesus being in the flesh. Yeah. The flesh and blood walking amongst us. Gives me chills to think of him coming into a building where I am. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Greek for Joshua. When Mary called him to dinner, she didn't say Jesus. She said, Yahshua. Mm -hmm. When his dad needed help in the shop. Yahshua. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let's not forget his humanity. Amen. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to church? I, I go to the church of Yahshua the Nazarene. Yeah. Yeah. All right, back, back to, okay, enough of that. <laughs> he was a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Why are we sad? Why our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Did he tell him? He was going to be in the grave for three days? He sure did. Look at the sign of Jonah. Amen. But boy, this is the truth in their heart. He's not necessarily the Messiah now. He's a prophet. Mm -hmm. oh, we're, we're a bit shaken here. And what we had believed. Give me the next one. <laughs> Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that he had even seen, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Was all of that the truth? Yes, they got the truth part right. Yes. But they're sad because they don't believe the testimony that was given. Next one. This is how I picture Cleopas and his friend. I think I've been both of those at different times in my life. A bruised reed. You ever suffered tragic news? You ever dealt with an illness of a loved one and you just feel like a bruised reed? As the flame of your faith ever got so dim that it is just a slight breath away from being quenched Amen. like a smoldering candle Amen. both these fellas are on the verge they've left Jerusalem they're sad they don't know what to think. You know, the last line is you and I, isn't it? Yes. And that name, the Gentiles will have hope. This is one of my favorite stories. That's why I chose it. <laughs> I think Jesus kind of snuck up on him. 
you know? I don't know if they walked past and he just appeared behind them. I don't know if they saw him in the distance and he joined up with them, but he snuck up on them one way or the other. They didn't know who he was. He sneaks up on me sometimes. It's usually when I'm driving. <laughs> and he's usually in the passenger seat. And I find that my frustration level may be yeah. aggravated. <laughs> James says, salt water shouldn't come from the same spring as fresh water. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he says, let that car in. Jesus says, let that car in. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. That's what yeah. I gotta love my enemies. He sneaks up on us. A bit of that humanity, I think, in Jesus. Verse 25. Oh, foolish ones. And you're slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Give me the next one. This was a three hour crash course, wasn't it? Yeah. Is there a passage up here that he didn't talk about? Well, I don't know if I got them all, but I guarantee you. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus referenced some of these very passages. Yeah, Peter did it in Acts, didn't he? Sure. Psalm 2, yeah. Psalm 110, yeah. 22. Yeah. Those were great fodder for those first gospel sermons. Amen. And Jesus has taken the time. He's taken the time and the patience to teach. I thought I could teach. Brother, I can't teach. They tried that in the sheriff's office. They said, we'd like you to be a field training officer. Put someone in my car, teach them how to do this job. I didn't have the patience. I admire you teachers. But, again, let me get back on the horse. Jesus interpreted for them all the prophets and all that Moses had said concerning himself. Next slide. They drew near to the village to which they were going. And Jesus acted as if he was going farther. I wonder why he did that. Why act like you're going for it? Maybe he wanted to see if these fellas had an open heart for what he was teaching them or whether it was closed. Because I guarantee you their response to this is going to show him whether or not they heard him and what the prophets had to say or whether or not they were going to shut down and continue to walk away from their faith. He puts the ball in their court. But they urged him, eh, if you want to stay, you can. Oh, no. It'd be nice. We're going to have dinner. You, you want to, we'll go have these. <laughs> no. They urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. Stay with us. What would you say to Jesus? Stay with us. Mm -hmm. For it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Mm 
It's the day of your resurrection. What might Jesus have been tempted to do? Wouldn't have been wrong to show up at Pilate's house. <laughs> it wouldn't have been wrong to walk across the temple court. Maybe say hi to Caiaphas. <laughs> or the Sanhedrin. Right. Anyone who shouted, crucify him, crucify him, wouldn't have been wrong. He didn't do that. He spent hours with two nobodies. You ever read from the book of Cleopas? Do you know? The other fellow's not even named. Why do you think? Why do you think these two? Because it's important. Mm -hmm. yes. It's the day of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He spends the huge majority of it with two guys who have really... I think it's important because I think it's you and I. I really do. It shows me that God cares about a nobody. Amen. Amen. Those Christians, those believers who are just plodding on through life, like so many of us, we don't have it all figured out, but we know what we are to do. We know who we are to have faith in. Amen. We expect all those other things. We would expect, I would full well expect them to go see the high priest and the kings. Maybe those who drove the nails. But it's two disciples with shaking faith. And he just doesn't stop in and say, hey, I, I'm resurrected. He spends time. And he teaches them the same way he teaches us. He didn't miraculously put it in them and go on. He taught them the same scriptures that we have. And I'm, I'm getting personal. I do not want us to avoid those scriptures. Yes? Yes. Next slide. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. You know, he did that four days earlier. Thursday night he took that bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he handed it to him he blessed it broke it gave it to them and their eyes were open one of my favorite stories. <laughs> Their eyes were open and they recognized him. Yeah. You remember how that felt? It's probably somewhere around the time you were baptized. Amen. That's right. You heard that truth and your eyes were opened and you recognized him and you said, what must I do? To be saved. Amen. Mm -hmm. And he vanished from their sight. Yes. How cool is that? <laughs> then.
They knew. They knew the resurrection was real. They knew what Mary had said was real. They knew because they saw him and they had spent hours with him. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? That's right. Burning hearts. Brad's prayer this morning made my heart burn in a good way. Yeah. Amen. I never thought about that heartburn aspect. Sorry. <laughs> in a good way. Next slide. You know, 14 miles is a long way to hike. You've done three of it. Three hours, seven miles, you're done for the day, you've checked in, you're just sitting down to dinner, and the Son of God hands you a piece of bread yes. and vanishes from your sight. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> and they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. That is the term for immediacy. In the same hour of the night, they were baptized, right? In the same hour, they got up, they checked out. The innkeeper said, sorry, you're not getting your, your money back. And they're like, that's okay. We got places to go and people to talk to. And they returned to Jerusalem. You know why they begged him not to go further? There was a reason. It was dark and it was dangerous. But what are they faced with? It's dark, it's dangerous, and we got to get back to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven. And those who were with them gathered together. And they came in and they said, hey, the Lord has risen indeed. And he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. In the breaking of the bread. Jim said it earlier. We're here today to remember Jesus in the breaking of the bread. You know what Mark tells us about this story? The disciples didn't believe them either. The eleven. They didn't believe Mary. They didn't believe Peter. They don't believe these two. They've shut the doors. They've locked them. Next slide. And as they were talking about these things, while we're all discussing it, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Shalom. Shalom. They were startled and frightened and thought they saw a ghost. Maybe they got an apology for not believing them. I don't know. Next slide. Boy, almost everything held true to its format, but this one, huh? Micah 6, verse 8. God has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Amen. Yes. That's what they did. They were humble, their hearts were open, they believed. We don't have a choice about whether or not we're going to walk, hike, rumble through life, 
type A personality rush to it or whether we're going to saunter. You don't have a choice. Time and life itself will force you down a path. Saul, later Paul, was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest, asked them for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, I really like that term. I wouldn't mind that being on my building. It's not my building. I wouldn't mind being referenced to the way. Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul was walking a path. And it was a path of murder and vengeance and hatred towards the disciples of the Lord. Acts 9. He doesn't like the way. Now we get to Acts 24. Same man. Yes same man is no longer walking his own path. This is the same man who is now submitted to God. He has submitted to the blood of Christ. He has submitted to the rulers that be. In fact, he's here uh, before King Felix and he says, however, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. I sought to persecute the way. I am now a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law that is written in the prophets. What's the difference between Acts 9 and Acts 24? What was it? Conversion. Conversion. <laughs> Baptism. The forgiveness of sins. The choice that one man made to walk with God, to no longer kick against the goats. Mm -hmm. From there on, he can saunter. I stated earlier that you are my beloved. I knew this would be here because I know your faith and I know that all things are ready. All things are ready to baptize, to put on Christ and to walk with God in the way. It's right here and it is ready and we would love nothing more than for you to do that while we sing an invitation song. Amen.